Okay, this is the lecture for European history for Wednesday, the 20th of April, 2022. Josef Vissarionovich Jugoshvili has become the unquestioned leader of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He did so by being general secretary and by mastering the detail that no one else would. Stalin was a harder worker than anyone around him. And what that means is the man, he kept uh, a vampiric schedule. He basically was awake and worked through the night and slept in the day. But more than that, he would pay attention to details. At the beginning of the party, or at the beginning of his rise through the party, Stalin was given uh, the routine jobs that were just dull. But by mastering all of the detail, by outworking his more intellectually able uh, comrades, Stalin was able to take command of the party in a way no one else was. Lenin inspired the party, faithful. But Stalin knew where the bodies were buried. He actually had most of them buried himself. And so ultimately, he was able to use the party apparatus to good effect, first against Trotsky with the help of the old Bolsheviks, uh, uh, Zinoviev and Kamenev, then with the old Bolshevik Nikolai Bukharin against Zinoviev and Kamenev. And in the end, Bukharin was, he stepped aside. He understood what was about to happen to him if he didn't. This led Stalin near the end of 1928, in sole charge of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. A totalitarian government with power without limit. The first definitive thing that Stalin does is he begins to campaign against the Kulaks. The Kulaks are the wealthy peasants. The Kulaks are the most <clears throat> enterprising and ambition, ambitious of Russia's farmers. The Kulaks were the people who took advantage of the new economic policy, made a little money, lived a little better. Communism always works through envy. Communism tells its dupes the only reason they have more than you is they cheated, or their ancestors cheated. It's not right. It's not good. We will make things equitable. We will bring equity, equality of result. And unfortunately, just as you cannot cheat an honest man by appealing to him in a bribe fashion, you cannot deny that most people, when they allow themselves not to be their best selves, are greedy, lazy, and envious. So communism appeals to the greedy, the lazy, and the envious, as well as to the foolish, idealistic intellectuals who genuinely believe that human beings can design paradise. The anti-Kulak campaign was designed to spark the envy of the poor farmers by demonizing anyone who did better than them. Many of the poor farmers realized that they were poorer than those Kulaks. What they didn't realize was that sooner or later, there were people poorer than them that would call them kulaks. At what point do you stop saying someone else has privilege? The campaign made it clear. It was open season on the kulaks. They weren't people anymore. They were enemies of the state. So the government began taking action against the kulaks. This is particularly true in the breadbasket of the old Soviet Union, the Ukraine. 
Kulaks were rounded up, often identified by their neighbors. They were put on trains and sent to Siberia by the tens of thousands. Their land was appropriated. But remember, this happened in conjunction with the forced collectivization of agriculture. So it's not like the biggest guy, biggest farmer in town loses his land and we all get to split it up amongst ourselves. That had been implied. That's not what's going to happen. No, we're all going to share all of our land together. And when the land belongs to everyone, the land belongs to no one. You don't decide what to plant, when to plant it, how to work it. The government does. They send experts from universities who have degrees in agronomy and the theories of Lysenko. And they will tell you how to farm and how to ranch and how to live in every way. You've given them your power by hating the kulaks and cheering as they got taken away. And you'd better shut up and behave and do what you're told or you will be identified as a kulak. Now, this predictably was a disaster for the crops. The Ukrainian farmers and the farmers in Russia lost massively in the coming harvest. There wasn't enough food. So, why wasn't there enough food? Was it that the forced collectivization of agriculture and getting rid of the kulaks was a mistake? Absolutely not. That's impossible. Comrade Stalin, the Bush, the boss, he had sanctioned this. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union's Politburo, their cabinet, had demanded this. The Communist Party and all of its local uh, officials directed this and made it happen. The leader is never wrong. The party is never wrong. So the failure of the crops has to do with saboteurs, enemy agents, wreckers, and counter-revolutionaries all. So now comes the NKVD, otherwise known as the GPU later known as the KGB, the Soviet Intelligence Service, which is directed not only against foreign spies and in foreign lands acting like our CIA, but they also act like our FBI, a national intelligence directorate designed to police the thought and speech and actions of anyone and everyone. The most fearsome part of the Soviet system was developed in imitation of the old Tsarist Okhrana, their secret police. The first leader is a guy named Felix Jerzinski, a tall, aesthetic, thin fellow with a goatee who was famous for driving a Rolls Royce around Moscow in the days of the Russian Civil War. The headquarters of the KGB, I'm going to call them, I'll call them the NKVD, this is the secret political police, was the Lubyanka. The Lubyanka was a prison. After Jerzinski died of old age, a statue of good old Felix was put in the square in front of the Lubyanka. It was there until the fall of the Soviet Union. These are the people who trained Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin, before he became the leader of Russia, was a KGB colonel, like the Mafia. Once you are in the KGB, you are never out. He was a disciple of Yuri Andropov, one of the most fearsome and scary individuals ever to come close to power in the 20th century. Since the harvest is going to fail, since the harvest is failing, it is time for the NKVD to go to work. They fan out throughout the countryside, working with their already existing system of spies and informers. They'll show up on your farm. You already know that you're lucky enough not to have been classified as a kulak and sent to Siberia. Where's the food? 
What food do I have? If, if an Obama, where's the food? But we gave it all up, just like we're... Where's the food? And a child, wife. No answer. Next, where's the food? Eventually the farmer finds something that's been hidden away under floorboards in a barn in the midst of a field. They produce something. At which point the farmer is guilty. He was going to be guilty anyway. But uh, once he produces something, he's really guilty. The NKBD then takes you away. You, the farmer. And through steep sleep deprivation, torture, and threats to your loved ones, they find out the answer to this question. Who were your accomplices? Who are your counter-revolutionary allies? Who else is in on this plot to undermine the revolution? And everyone has a breaking point. No one stands up infinitely under torture, under brainwashing. So you give up the names of people in your world, and then the same thing happens to them. And they do that, and the same thing happens to them. And the party has evidence of an extensive counter-revolutionary plot to wreck the harvest and undermine the revolution. And it was Comrade Stalin's brilliance that brought this to the front. What results is the Ukrainian famine. A man-made famine, the greatest in history up till that point, only exceeded by Mao's intentional famine in the late 50s and early 60s, the great leap forward. In the Ukrainian famine, between 10 and 30 million people are purposefully starved to death, as all the food that exists is stripped from the countryside and brought to the cities and given to the communists and the people that the communists designate as worthy of survival. In particular, this is a backdoor genocide against the Ukrainian nation, against the ethnic group uh, that is Ukrainians. So the Russian settlers that were moved into the Ukraine by Stalin in the eastern Ukraine, in the Donetsk base, and so forth, they get what little food is left. But the Ukrainians, as a national group, are systematically starved. This goes on for three years. Intensely for about two. Forced collectivization of agriculture leads to a political terror and a man-made famine. Now that Stalin has reorganized the agricultural sector, it's time for him to reorganize, with the same brilliancy, the industrial sector. So Stalin sets up, in 1929, his first five-year plan. The five-year plan is a national industrial policy where the government in Moscow, the Communist Party, the Politburo, and the Bush, the Bush, uh, the, the boss, Stalin, mandate everything. What kind of products will be made? With what kind of heavy equipment will they be produced? What kind of heavy equipment will be produced to make the new products? The emphasis is going to be on what is called heavy industry. Steel production. Armaments production. Because Stalin is preparing for war. This is before Hitler even takes power. Stalin realizes that with communism only in one nation, we are encircled, we are surrounded by hostile powers from China to Poland to Finland, and behind them are the capitalists in France and Britain and the United States. So the Soviet economy has shifted to a war economy in 1929. Entire new settlements are built, like the city of Magnitogorsk, or the city of the Magneto. A Magneto is not just a villain in the X-Men series. A Magneto is a uh, device used in um, engines. I actually don't really know what a Magneto does. I think it spins. 
I think it's something that's like an electromagnet that spins. But whatever it is, Magneto Gorse is going to be the central production hub of Magnetos for uh, Soviet Skaya Soyuz, for the Soviet Union. Probably said that wrong. Say it? Sovietsky Soyuz. Sovietsky. Is it Sovietsky? Sovietsky. Sovietsky Soyuz. Thank you. So, the Soviet Union. What this means is that factory production is no longer in the hands of factory workers, which is what communism was supposed to do, nor is it in the hand of factory managers, because important people don't do field work. In the communist system, the important people are the planners. They're like in Plato's Republic, a bunch of thoughtful intellectuals who design everything. Like an architect looking at a model of a new city he's going to build. <laughs> like a god looking down at the peons and ants who inhabit his world. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union will design Russia's new industrial economy and prepare the Soviet Union for war. Stalin's five-year plans are instrumental in this. But, just as in the agricultural sector, when you steal creative autonomy, independence, and scope from people who do the work and actually know what they're doing, ah, it doesn't quite work out. So part of the five-year plan are massively high production go go uh, targets, goals. I, I couldn't decide between saying the word goals and targets, so it came out, gut, gut. gargets, tolls. Production targets and goals, ludicrously high, impossible to produce, and everyone knew it. So why are these reasonable goals set by Tovari Stalin, by Comrade Stalin, why are they not being met? It certainly can't be, because the concept of the five-year plan runs counter to practical economics. No, no, no. Communist leaders are economic geniuses. It can't be because Comrade Stalin is wrong, because Comrade Stalin is never wrong. Otherwise, he wouldn't be Comrade Stalin. The Politburo, they may have people that are not as smart as Stalin, but Stalin guides them. The Communist Party of the Soviet Union, led by Stalin, they set this all up. So, of course, as with the agricultural sector, Every failure to produce must be the result of wreckers, counter-revolutionaries, foreign spies, and traitors. And these wreckers, counter-revolutionaries, foreign spies, and traitors must be rooted out. So, once again, the secret police, the NKBD, goes to work. They already have networks of informants in every community, in every factory, probably in every family. The Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts in the Soviet Union, the Komsomols, are um, the model that Hitler uses for the Hitler Youth. It's basically an organization designed to have the state and the party be mother and father, not mommy and daddy. And in fact, mommy and daddy are going to be spied on by their own kids, some of whom inform directly to the KGB. Just think about how that works. Think about the arguments that adolescents have with their parents and the intensity of that. Well, what if the adolescent is uh, part of the Komsomols, the Young Communists Association, or a young pioneer? What if um, uh, what if they tell on their parents? I'm going to tell on you. It means something totally different in this situation. And like with the agricultural sector, people are found because they're identified by their co-workers, by spies, by secret policemen in the factories. And they are tortured and brainwashed until they give up names and details. Whether these names and details are real or not doesn't matter. Victims, enemies of the state, traitors and counter-revolutionary wreckers, they are found and they are punished. However, please get the shades and shut the fan and turn the lights off. There is a light 
in this darkness of traitors and counter-revolutionaries. His name is Alexei Stakhanov. Hero of labor, not only meets the production <laughs> goals, he exceeds them because he cares, because he works hard, because he loves his people and he loves his job and he loves the utopia and he loves Comrade Stalin. There are also a bunch of people in his mind who are doing part of the work that he's getting credit for. So, Stakhanov demonstrates that not only are the production targets and goals reasonable and achievable, but with genuine patriotic dedication, they can be overmatched and exceeded. Stakhanov becomes a national hero, and the Stakhanovite movement are workers who promise to work as long as is necessary, 16, 18, 20 hours a day, to meet the production goals set by Comrade Stalin and build communism. They are one picture of what is called in the propaganda the new Soviet man. The new Soviet man is the kind of individual worthy of living in communism, born after the revolution, knowing only communism, caring enough to give of their time, of their work, of their effort, risking everything for the motherland. <coughs> so, the five-year plan and the forced collectivization of agriculture is going to be somewhat costly uh, in human lives. I suppose I will show you the other videos now. And I will... Oh, I already played music. Let's see if I get copyright striked from the 1930s. It's possible, I suppose. Uh, we're not there yet. Now, what kind of man is Comrade Stalin. So this is a famous... Stalin is der strahlende Held. Im Herbst 1944 hält er eine große Rede. Der Applaus bei seinem Auftritt scheint gar nicht mehr zu enden. Echte Begeisterung. Keiner wagt es, als erster mit dem Klatschen aufzuhören. 
Eine besondere Vorrichtung hilft aus der Verlegenheit. Eleven and a half minutes, one of them went on. It's on camera. I'm not going to waste eleven and a half minutes of class time on people applauding to Stalin. Because, and you might ask yourself, why? Why would they keep applauding her comrade Stalin? Because whoever stops clapping first is going to be noticed. The same thing happens under Mao in China and under Xi Jinping today and under Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un in North Korea. Everyone claps enthusiastically. They show their passion. They sh oh, I didn't stop. I just paused. They showed their passion. They showed their spirit. They showed their new communist heart. The buzzer was pressed by Comrade Stalin himself, who was ready to get on with things. So he stands there getting his drink ready because he owns them. They're his. They belong to him. He is, in effect, their god. And when he's ready, beep, stop clapping, sit down, listen to what I've got to say. That's the boss. All of this sets the stage for what is to come. The first forced collectivization passes. The first five-year plan is on its way. The second five-year plan is being planned. It's the early 1930s. The rest of the world is experiencing the Great Depression. The Great Depression is sparked by the unstable German economy, the unstable American stock market, and uh, buying too much on credit, among other things. American businesses and bankers try to stop the bleeding, but it's like trying to put a Band-Aid on an arterial wound. J.P. Morgan almost bankrupts himself. Stockbrokers in 1929, New York, October of, jump out the window because they can't face their families, because their entire life savings and the life savings of everyone who put their trust in this particular stockbroker is gone. So they die by the droves. By 1933, one in four American men are out of work. I'll say that again. One in four American men are out of work. My grandfather knew people who starved in Vermont, a farming area. My grandmother's family got by because they had a cousin who was a butcher. So the butcher always got a hold of some meat. But meat was hard to come by. Food was hard, hard to come by. My grandmother's family in the Bronx knew people who starved. One quarter of the American workforce is out of work without a social service net, without welfare. And that's the United States, which is better off than many places. But in the Soviet Union, because the economy is not connected to the global free market, they're shielded from that. They've got their own problems. They've got the forced collectivization. They've got the Ukrainian famine. They've got the five-year plan. But Stalin, like every tyrant, understands that you keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. What that means is... The people that are most dangerous to you are not a bunch of revolutionaries out in the countryside. It's your closest advisors. It's the people you trust and depend upon. So one of the things that Stalin does is he develops a personal group of male buddies. And he'll invite them to his apartments in the Kremlin to watch American movies, he loved American movies, and to drink and to talk. Now, this is on top of a full work day. And unlike Comrade Stalin, who can sleep as late as he wants, they have to be at work by 9 or 10 in the morning. So he'll have his buddies come, and they'll drink, and he'll make fun of them, and he'll have them play jokes on one another. And these are not nice jokes. These are unkind jokes. And every so often in the midst of this, there is a moment where he shows his truly scary face. Because he's, he likes to, because it's fun. 
He does this with Vyacheslav Molotov, who is his foreign minister throughout most of throughout all of World War II in the early Cold War. For most of that time, Molotov's wife is in a gulag. She was taken in the middle of the night one night. Stalin never mentions it. Molotov never mentions it. Molotov, in many ways around the world, seems like Stalin's number two man. Molotov's got a drink with Stalin. He's got to laugh with Stalin. He's got to be the butt of Stalin's jokes. Stalin occasionally will make a joke about his missing wife and his frustration. Meanwhile, the reality is Molotov's wife is living in a slave labor camp. So Stalin's drinking buddies are one of the ways that he deals with the question of personal loyalty in his inner circle. He gets an inner circle so docile and so afraid of him that they'll do things like be reflexively loyal to him, even when he holds family members in captivity. The other thing he begins to do is um, set up purge trials. Just as with Trotsky, and then Zinoviev and Kamenev, and then Bukharin, Stalin is going to find fault with people retroactively. It's like going through somebody's social media and finding something that they said 10 or 15 years ago that doesn't match the current politically correct narrative. And then you expose them. And they have to face ridicule and they have to publicly apologize and humiliate themselves or they're going to lose their jobs, they'll lose, they'll lose their homes. They'll be doxxed. They'll have to deal with people at their houses. But in Stalin's case, the NKVD is very much involved. Now, at the beginning of the purges, the head of the NKVD is an official named Yagoda. And Yagoda is willing to go along with looking at the party leadership itself. And much like Robespierre with the Committee of Public Safety, assuming that there are traitors in the various hierarchies of Soviet Russia, and with that assumption in mind, all you have to do is find them, identify them, take them out of their world. Now, the highest Soviet officials lived in an apartment <coughs> complex in Moscow built by Stalin. And by 1930s Russia standards, it's an absolute masterpiece. It's got dark wood furnishings and uh, crenelly. It's just a beautiful apartment building. But every night, the officials have packed bags right by their doors because cars show up in the middle of the night. And up the back steps comes the jackbooted NKVD secret police. They ring the doorbell. Whatever official is unlucky enough to be on that night opens the door. And if they're lucky, only they are taken rather than their whole family. Their apartment may be searched or it may be left. And they're taken to the Lubyanka for interrogation. <laughs> Maybe they'll return. Maybe they'll never return. Maybe they'll return broken after being brainwashed. Maybe their family members are taken with the same possibilities. To be in the elite in Stalin's Russia is no guarantee of safety. In fact, you are in greater danger because Stalin personally knows you. And every night he adapts lists of people to be interrogated, people to be gulagged, and people to be executed. He makes his phone calls and lives change and people disappear. Where some of the most famous end up is in the show trials, the purge trials. Stalin's favorite persecutor is a guy named Andrei Vyshinsky. Andrei Vyshinsky, well, I'll show you him in action. This is the trial of Nikolai Bukharin in the 1930s. Bukharin submitting to Stalin isn't enough. Bukharin must be eliminated. 
A year and a half later, Stalin eliminated another former comrade, Nikolai Bukharin, the prominent Marxist theorist whom Lenin once described as the favorite of the party. Stalin and Bukharin had worked together against Trotsky. And later against Zinoviev and Kamenev, here with Stalin on Red Square. The relationship with Stalin began to break down at the end of the 1920s, but Bukharin was given a reprieve for several more years. He was arrested in 1937. The trial of Nikolai Bukharin and 20 others began in March of 1938. As in the other show trials, the prosecution was led by Vyshinsky, who represented the state, and Stalin. This trial, which shocked the world, was extensively filmed. Yet the accused, Bukharin, is nowhere to be seen in any of the pictures. In contrast, all of state prosecutor Vyshinsky's tirades have been recorded. Exactly one year ago, Comrade Stalin analyzed deficiencies in our work and arrived at the conclusion that the Trotskyite hypocrites must be liquidated. This direction he outlined in an article he wrote in which he stated two words on the deviants, saboteurs, spies and others. Trotskyites and Bukharinites, your honor, this whole right-wing Trotskyite bloc whose leadership is now in the dock is not a political party. It is not a political movement. This bloc has no ideological content, nothing intellectual, as was the case with earlier members of this clique. Now it has sunk into the fetid ground of underground spies. This is a fifth column, a Ku Klux Klan which has opened the door to the enemy, who is a sniper from a secret perch, who wants to help invading enemies conquer our villages and cities, who wants to contribute to the defeat of their own country. It is clear that these so-called masters must be mercilessly crushed and destroyed. Some of the accused, as you remember, especially Bukharin, did not even make an attempt to put a good face on a bad situation. Bukharin likes it, how should I put this, to describe himself as a theorist, a Marxist, in fact, an orthodox Marxist. Bukharin shamelessly lied back in 1918 when he broke with left-wing communists. Bukharin is also telling now lies before the court. Bukharin knew of the plan to arrest Lenin, Stalin and Svetlov. And who knew of such a plan would also have carried it out. Who is prepared to use force is also prepared to commit murder. The plot has been uncovered. The mask of treason has been torn from their faces, now and forever. Let the verdict be heard like thunder, like a fresh purifying thunderstorm of Soviet justice. Our entire country, no matter whether young or old, demand only one thing, that the traitors and spies who wanted to sell out the homeland should be shot like rabid dogs. The masses demand only one thing, to stamp out this accursed vermin. Fifty million people of our great socialist homeland and want to express our deep thanks to Nikolai Ivanovich Yetsov, the People's Commissar for Internal Affairs at so, Vyshinsky is the last stage. The head of the NKVD, Yagoda, is found to be not enthusiastic enough. So he is replaced 
by Nikolai Yezhov. Nikolai Yezhov is a very small statured fellow. And he is pictured here on the right. They call him a dwarf. Okay, so here's a picture of Stalin and Yezhov, as it is originally. Molotov, the foreign minister whose wife is in prison, is on the left. But in later versions, they airbrush out Yezhov. Now, this is just one example of what I have here in this book. The Commissar Vanishes. Can you get the lights, please? On the cover, you can see a picture of Stalin and Kir Sergei Kirov, and uh, there's Stalin, Kirov, and Molotov, and there's another guy over here whose name I don't remember. But as the purges go on, the picture is changed so that instead of being a four comrades, it then becomes three comrades, as the guy on the left is unpersoned. And then it's just Stalin and Kirov. Kirov was assassinated at Stalin's orders because Kirov was um, independent-minded. He could think for himself. He was the head of the Leningrad party and very popular, and Stalin was afraid that Kirov would replace him. So, Stalin has him assassinated and then creates the uh, cult of St. Kirov. Well, they don't call him saint, but that's how they treat him. The same pictures again and again are retouched and altered so that the current moment's narrative can be reflected. It's not enough for a totalitarian to change the future or the present. True totalitarians must also change the past. Elsewhere in the book, you've got, this entire book is examples of pictures that just have people disappearing because they no longer work. Trotsky and Lenin often uh, have Trotsky disappear. But if there's something else that happens that's on its own way uglier, Instead of using the subtle airbrush technique, what they will do is, where is it? They'll either rip people out of the photograph, and you just got this hole where people used to be. There used to be a person there, not anymore. The person's gone. There's just a hole in the picture. Don't ask questions. Nothing to see here. Move along. I, am just, I, I went past the page I wanted to show you. Well, you got these. You got portraits in various books that are just blacked out. The faces are blacked out with India ink because they're no longer people. They've been unpersoned. That's pretty gruesome because you know that every one of those people with black faces is dead or in a gulag somewhere. They'll recut photographs so that you have people... Ah, here's one. It's, it's more effective to see a picture of people and then the black circles over the faces of people who are no longer people. They're not traitors. Whenever you are dealing with people who cannot handle the truth of history, they feel the need to rewrite it, you're dealing with totalitarians. This is one of the real problems I have with the woke movement. They are not sufficiently satisfied to simply change the present by advocating their beliefs or changing the future by changing the present. They want to also redesign the past. They want to take a man like Thomas Jefferson, who did own slaves, who slept with them, who had children with them, but who in 1776 spent real political capital to try to get rid of slavery. 
Jefferson's life was spent trying to expand the definition of liberty to more and more people, and he freed his slaves on his death. But he's considered to be a virtueless, treasonous, racist, Ku Klux Klansman by modern woke historians. That's not history. That's propaganda. Propaganda is the use of advertising techniques to sell ideas. The final purge is the purge of the Red Army, which is going to bite Stalin in the backside and Russia too, because in the late 1930s, any Soviet officer that showed any initiative, any drive, any independence of thought, uh, any, any, any support for the new theories of armored warfare or close air support, uh, was probably going to be taken out and shot, bless you, bless you, you. or they'd be taken and gulag. Only a few intelligent officers ex escaped the uh, purge of the Red Army. So in the Soviet Union under Stalin, you have a system whereby everyone is scrutinized. Every failure is blamed on enemy agents and wreckers. The secret police has complete reign to bring in people and torture them to get evidence that they use to then bring in other people and torture them to get evidence. Everyone is afraid. Everyone is a potential enemy, saboteur, counter-revolutionary record. And it is this fear which really typifies life under a totalitarian system. Questions, comments, thoughts? Thank you for your attention. We're set. I'll find the book.